All right. Good morning, KW Milwaukee. Hopefully, uh, it's a beautiful day in Milwaukee. It is. The sun's shining, uh, despite how it started. But it's a beautiful day, and we're back. So, uh, good morning on a beautiful October 15th. Um, I'm going to challenge the group this morning on two things. One, it's amazing how few of us in general, this is a rash generalization, can sit still for five minutes. It's true, okay? Without you touching your phone, without you flicking a pencil, without you taking a note, without whatever it might be, okay? But here's here's the thing. I have a message for you this morning that I think the world needs to hear. In an incredibly divisive time, politically, socially, all the other stuff that goes on in our world, but also like for an industry that's going through massive change. You know, I, I had a, I did a lot of thinking the last two weeks as I was out and thinking through how people have treated each other and how who's right and who's wrong and whose approach in the business is right and whose approach in the business is wrong and who whose forms are better, or whose negotiating skills are better, right? And I'd say it's been an interesting time. At the same time, you have all these other social pressures on top of people where you see the good, the bad, the ugly. And so I'm going to start with the challenge to you to be present. And really, like, I get it. For most team meetings, you're like, all right, I should be present here. I can, you know, tune out here. I can do this or I can do that. I have a really simple message for five minutes, okay? And my challenge to you is, can you be present to understand what I'm trying to send to you? So, here we go. I don't even know why the fuck I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll get back to that because I <laughs> forgot about other things. So, here we go. For those of you who've been around for a long time, you'll understand this is my favorite TED Talk of all time. I have not played this in a team meeting since 2018. So for many of you, you will hear this for the first time. Some of you, you are going to hear it as a repeat because I think some of us need to hear it again and again and again and again because we need to be told things multiple times before it sets in. So my challenge to you is be present and think about how this message impacts you personally, professionally, the relationships you have, how you interact with your peers, and how you treat other people. Okay, here you go. An evolutionary biologist at Purdue University named William Muir studied chickens. He was interested in productivity. I think it's something that concerns all of us. But it's easy to measure in chickens because you just count the eggs. He wanted to know what could make his chickens more productive, so he devised a beautiful experiment. Chickens live in groups, so first of all, he selected just an average flock, and he let it alone for six generations. But then he created a second group of the individually most productive chickens. You could call them super chickens. And he put them together in a super flock, and each generation he selected only the most productive for breeding. After six generations had passed, what did he find? Well, the first group, the average group, was doing just fine. They were all plump and fully feathered, and egg production had increased dramatically. What about the second group? Well, all but three were dead. They'd pecked the rest to death. <laughs> the individually productive chickens had only achieved their success by suppressing the productivity of the rest. Now, as I've gone around the world talking about this and telling this story in all sorts of organizations and companies, people have seen the relevance almost instantly, and they come up and they say things to me like, that super flock, that's my company. <laughs> or, that's my country. Or, that's my life. All my life, I've been told that the way we have to get ahead is to compete, get into the right school, get into the right job, get to the top. And I've really never found it very inspiring. 
I've started and run businesses because invention is a joy and because working alongside brilliant creative people is its own reward. And I've never really felt very motivated by pecking orders or by super chickens or by superstars. But for the past 50 years, we've run most organizations and some societies along the super chicken model. We've thought that success is achieved by picking the superstars, the brightest men or occasionally women in the room, and giving them all the resources and all the power. And the result has been just the same as in William Muir's experiment, aggression, dysfunction, and waste. If the only way the most productive can be successful is by suppressing the productivity of the rest, then we badly need to find a better way to work and a richer way to live. Okay, here's what I'd tell you. I'm gonna pause it there for the first three minutes. Individually productive chickens had only achieved their success by suppressing the productivity of the rest. She found purpose and fulfillment in working alongside brilliant and creative people because it's its own reward. And I want to leave you, or not leave you, I want to plant that seed for you in an industry where you have two people that have to negotiate. You have a household. Most households have multiple people that have to work together in order to create the household to make it work. Okay? I won't even go into politics or a lot of other social issues. My point to it is we have to depend on each other to make the thing work, whatever the thing is. Okay? Otherwise, and we see this a lot in our business in really tense negotiations, what you end up seeing is you see aggression, dysfunction, and waste. You couldn't get along with a co-broke, you didn't get the deal. You have a poor reputation, the listing agent chose the other deal. You talk shit about someone, that shit came around, and guess what? They know about it. Like, I mean, you can go into all the other stuff, or what, quite frankly, people put on social media. Like, it's amazing how the way people think they need to get ahead, and I'll just use politics as a simple example right now, What's so disheartening to me in that space is the way that either side has to get ahead is they have to tear the other side down. I don't know. I think it's really stupid, but I think there's a lot of lessons in life and most especially in this business, how we have to work with really brilliant and creative people. And when you do that and you find the value in who you're working with, you'll create the reward monetarily fulfillment wise, the purpose you get out of what you do. So I'm going to play the, the final two minutes of a 15 minute Ted talk and you can watch the 15 minutes if you so choose. And here's the second piece to it. And evil. And what is it that makes some groups obviously more successful and more productive than others? Well, that's the question a team at MIT took. To research, they brought in hundreds of volunteers, they put them into groups, and they gave them very hard problems to solve. And what happened was exactly what you'd expect, that some groups were very much more successful than others. But what was really interesting was that the high-achieving groups were not those where they had one or two people with spectacularly high IQ, nor were the most successful groups the ones that had the highest aggregate IQ. Instead, they had three characteristics, the really successful teams. First of all, they showed high degrees of social sensitivity to each other. This is measured by something called the reading the mind in the eye test. It's broadly considered a test for empathy, and the groups that scored highly on this did better. Secondly, the successful groups gave roughly equal time to each other so that no one voice dominated but neither were there any passengers. And thirdly, the more successful groups had more women in them. <laughs> now, 
Was this because women typically score more highly on the reading of mind in the eye test, so you were getting a doubling down on the empathy quotient, or was it because they brought a more diverse perspective? We don't really know. But the striking thing about this experiment is that it showed what we know, which is some groups do better than others. But what's key to that is their social connectedness to each other. The social connectedness to each other. The three things of highly successful groups that they found in the MIT study. High degrees of social, social sensitivity to each other. They gave each other equal time. They gave each other equal time. And the third typically had more women. Okay. And the social connectivity to it is how they found increased levels of productivity, purpose, and fulfillment. And so my challenge to the group in a very divisive time and when things are going wonky or quite frankly, I think there's about less than 30 days less left in a very divisive time for our environment and community is how do you look at someone and who you're dealing with and just find a level of respect in what you're doing? That's it. And it doesn't require you to take them down. So my challenge to you in this time, politically, socially, changes within our industry, how you navigate where we go next, is how do you create that social connectivity to each other to find common ground? If you do that, you'll be ultimately very successful. If not, you'll end up just like the James Muir experiment that they did over six generations of chickens. And the most, the only way that the most successful the most successful group was the average group that stuck together. The highly productive chickens that ended up pecking each other to death, only two or three of them ended up living over six generations. So there's a lot of undertones and messages in that TED Talk. And I saved it for a certain period of time because I wanted to see how things would play out. And I was like, you know what? Today's the day. Because I think a lot of people need to hear it. And sometimes it just takes you to just say, hold on, we got to figure this out together. Make sense? So if you so choose, I'll send out uh, the rest of the TED Talk. It's 15 minutes long. It's, I think, one of the most profound TED Talks you can think about in such a business where interpersonal relationships matter. And it's you can apply it to so many different things within your life. Cool? All right. What there you go. is it? What? What is it? All right. Um, I'll go back to the very beginning here in a sec. Office operations updates for the group. Okay. As a reminder, I just saw this come out yesterday. Uh, Energage, which is run through the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, runs their top workplaces. We've been incredibly fortunate to be recognized as a top workplace, including the top workplace the last two years in a row, which caught me by surprise. That's a whole different story for a different day. Uh <laughs> But the uh, survey for 2024 is now out and live. You will get a few pings. Um, just for those of you who haven't participated in the survey in the past, it's completely anonymous. We actually don't even see the results. Uh, they don't, I wish we would so that we could act on some of the feedback, uh, but we don't get it. It's completely anonymous and we don't know where we sit until we go to this awards ceremony where I decided to show up in a pair of jeans and boots and then went up on stage in front of 700 people when I should have been wearing a suit and tie. Uh, but that, again, different story for a different day. So Energage sent out the survey starting yesterday. I saw it come into my email inbox. I believe that you'll get another one this morning at 1015, according to this. And uh, I would sincerely appreciate your honest feedback around your viewpoints on how we operate the KW and uh, positive, negative, and different. It all helps us benchmark versus our peer group and um, would appreciate your time in doing so. All right, with that, Linz, I'm gonna flip it over to tech and marketing. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, so last week was all about fall cleanup, clean up your database this time of year, ways that you can do it within command. Um, but now I want to shift gears and talk about ways that you can build your database. And that's really what we're going to focus on in the next couple of weeks with our tech and marketing training. 
Um, but one of the ways, and I talk about this a lot, but I wanted to kind of do a deeper dive into this today is the 12 direct campaign. And this is strictly a campaign that's talked about in the MREA. Um, and I just wanted to kind of go through that a little bit with you guys today. Um, so what exactly is a 12 direct? Well, it's how you work your haven't met portion of your database. Um, it stands for 12 direct mail pieces that are mailed out annually. Uh, it includes your mailing lists for farm areas and or any other demographic groups. Um, and so to think about it, for every 50 people that you market yourself to 12 times a year, you can reasonably expect to generate one sale from that. So at a 50 to 1 ratio, you'll have to have 2,500 people in your database to consistently hit an annual goal of 50 closed sales. So that's just something to think about if this is maybe something that you want to loop into your 36 touch, if you want to include that 12 direct campaign, and then just keep this in mind when you're thinking about, you know, your goal, setting your goals every single year. Um, so you obviously don't have to have 2,500 people in your database, but that's kind of the numbers that you're working with there. So this is something that you can plan and set up each 12-month um, campaign all at once, either at the beginning of the year. Um, now is a great time to start planning this and plan out your content for 2025. And the best thing about this is that there are tools within command in order to help you send these out. Um, so what you would do is create a direct mail campaign within command. Um, I love the fact that you can either target your database. So if you have those mailing addresses already within your database, you can send them out. Otherwise, you can choose a radius um, on the map which you can see on the screen there. So this is not only great for circle prospecting, if you're sending those list, just listed or just sold postcards, but it's gonna help you establish that 12 direct campaign as well. So there's no need to purchase, gather, or upload mailing lists. Um, the system will allow you to pull those addresses directly from that, that radius view, that map. You'll simply enter in an address, whether it's your own home address and you want to target your, your own neighborhood, or if it's just a general address for an area that you want to farm. Um, you can choose the, the number of homes that you want to target, or you can draw a polygon. So you can get very specific with exactly the area that you're drawing and targeting on there. You can also choose advanced filters like property type, bedroom count, year built, or the, um, the year last sold and the price point as well. So you can get really, really specific for that area that you're farming. Now, if you are unsure of the content to what to send, um, that's where we come in. That's where our marketing concierge can help you. So that's where you see those 12 direct campaigns come into play. We're gathering local content that you can send out. And the, the goal with these is that it is these are postcards and content that have shelf life. So people are saving these for a few weeks to a month to six months at a time. Um, and so we'll gather the content, we'll create these for you, and you can utilize these for your 12 direct campaigns. And you can use all of the ones that we we um, create, or you can pick and choose which ones. Um, so, uh, and these are always created as both a, um, a postcard, an email, and social media post as well. So that QR code is going to take you into where you can find those. Um, but now, again, is a great time to build your 12 Direct for 2025. You can scan that code and just see the content that we've created in the past so that you can plan this out. So you can see that we will put together and pull ice, local ice skating rinks, dog parks. We'll always do the brewers, the bucks, the packers schedule, um, apple orchards, farmers market. Markets. Um, so again, great time to plan this out. Look at the content that we've created in the past um, so that you can really jot down that calendar, plan that out, um, and we'll always um, come out with new um, designs every single year for these. So 
And as I mentioned, we're going to be diving into that training this week. So Thursday at 11, it's on Zoom. Um, I'll be going through exactly how to set up that um, direct mail campaign within command. Um, and then next week is a whole other way to target your database and um, build your database with paid ad campaigns. Um, so a lot of good stuff and good trainings coming up. And that's it. Thank you. All right. We got the sheriff and the lieutenant with a few compliance updates around what compensation the seller agrees to in a listing contract. Because there's been quite, there's been some confusion on this and a lot of questions. So with that, Joni or Steph, you're up. It's I. Um, oh, the sheriff. Yeah. Um, you're right. These are still confusing parts. Uh, Steph and I <clears throat> sort of talking about the most common questions we're still getting. And so we wanted to just do a quick um, informative decision <laughs> for you to take with you when you're filling out these compensation agreements or uh, writing it in the offer or whatever. But we wanted to help clear it up. Um, so I'm asking for five minutes of your concentration on this too. <laughs> Um, the seller, these two or <clears throat> these first questions were true and false. They came from the WRA yesterday. You may have seen them or may not, but I thought I'd throw them in because they are relevant to the questions we're getting. Um, a seller approved a listing firm's offer of compensation. The listing firm should not tell the cooperating firm how much they are offering, but should tell them to have the buyers write it in the offer. True or false? I'd like to hear a resounding false. 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 Failure to disclose how much a seller has approved for a listing firm's offer of compensation is not in line with consumer transparency, which is what we're going for. Refusing to disclose this information and telling a cooperating firm to have the buyer write it in the offer <clears throat> is a listing firm making a decision that does not belong to them. That decision belongs to the seller. <clears throat> so it comes from the seller, what they're willing to offer, and they have to tell you how much they're offering. A listing in MLS indicates the seller is offering concessions. The listing firm must say how much the seller is offering. True or false? Another resounding false. The seller might be open to offering concessions, but has not decided how much and will decide it if they are willing to pay when reviewing offers to purchase. The MLS will not have anything in there, but it will <clears throat> be up to you, the buyer's agent, to put down what you would like for a concession. Um, next slide. Just a little more on concessions. And I want to inject right here that concessions really aren't being very popular. So I wanted you to be clear about concessions, but we don't see a lot of them coming across our offers. But if a seller is offering concessions, does that have to be noted in the listing contract and noted in MLS posting that the seller is offering concessions? Is that true or false? True. That is true. And uh, Kimmy and Steph and I were discussing this the other day that uh, concessions are being offered and acted upon, but it is not in the listing contract. MLS doesn't care. They're not cross-checking that, but um, Kimmy's going to look for it. You should be responsible to, if your seller is offering concessions, make sure that that agreement is in your listing contract with the seller. Um, so, but the buyer decides what the concessions are. This uh, next slide is very short, but I can't tell you how many questions I've gotten on this. And if you think, oh, this is my call, she's, you know, throwing me under the bus call. Um, <laughs> you're not the only one. There must have been many, many. Joan's many. bus is very light, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, vicious. But make clear when you're filling out the listing contract, that the total commission is on line 30, like 6% or 5.5 or whatever. And then further on in on line 57 is where you have compensation to others. 
So if the seller is deciding 2.4 or two or whatever, that's what goes on those. Um, many agents were splitting it and putting on line 30, the 3.6 and putting on line 57, for example, the 2.4. No. So keep that in mind and maybe we won't get any more calls on that. <laughs> Uh, next one, uh, this is probably the most important one, and it, we still get lots of confusion on this. So going over it again, um, compensation agreement or lines 5, 43, 44 in the offer to purchase. If the listing firm is offering compensation agreement to the buyer's firm that covers the buyer agency fee, it is not necessary for the buyer to ask the seller to pay the buyer's firm in the offer to purchase. That's the old belt and suspenders analogy. The optional provision in the offer requesting the seller to pay the buyer's firm fee may be used if the listing firm is not offering a compensation agreement to the cooperating firms, or if the offer of compensation is less than the buyer agency firm in the buyer agency agreement. So the buyer is asking the seller to pay the balance. It was a call I got this morning. You know, they're offering two, um, the seller was offering 2% to the cooperating broker. Uh, the buyer agency agreement on this cooperating broker was 2.4. He either had to ask in the offer for 0.4% uh, or keep it at two, and but he had to change, amend the buyer agency agreement to two. So that's something that you have to be clear on and you have to understand um, which choice you're going to make, how your buyer responds to this too. And then the last one, which I think is really ignored, uh, most of us are using buyer agency these days, but if you're not, you cannot ask for compensation in the offer. It is only to be used for a buyer's firm under buyer agency. So um, those are the most uh, popular calls that we're getting. And hopefully if we clear up this very last little bit of confusion that um, you'll be good. Sweet, Sheriff Reed, appreciate it. Guys, Thanks. I think I'll use this as an opportunity to help remind you, and I've I've used this analogy on several occasions, but I think it's a good time to do it. Um, how do really expensive things position their brands? That's kind of a loaded question. So I don't expect you to know the answer. Really expensive, let's just call it consumer brands. Someone wants to buy, make you buy an expensive watch. Someone wants to make you buy an expensive sports car or something else. Do you know how they position themselves? Next to things that are more expensive than them. For example, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, where do they showcase them? at yacht in private jet sales. Why? Because a $10 million yacht makes a Ferrari at 500,000 make very small. Why is it that Rolex, Gucci, Dior, all these brands, why is it that those brands all, if you look in within a shopping location, why those brands are all always in the same spot? Yes, there's an element of rising tides lifts all ships because they're focusing on the same consumer, but it also makes their the price they charge for a Louis Vuitton bag seem cheap when it's next to the Dior store or why Gucci feels very relatively affordable when it's next to, I don't know, I'm not a shopper, but I don't know, whatever else it might be. It's all about brand positioning and how you position your professional fees to make people understand how they're digestible or manageable. Most more often than not, you're able to do it. It's just how you position yourself to make them feel inexpensive or expensive. And those that aren't getting what they believe their value, it's because they're making, they're positioning their fees to be more expensive instead of positioning themselves to view it in a less expensive light. Next time you go shopping, pay attention to that. You don't have a Gucci store next to Goodwill. <laughs> you don't. And it's all about brand positioning. So, there you go. A little tidbit for you on brand positioning. All right. I'm going to wrap us up home with training, education, market insights, at lore, and September awards. Ready? As we alluded to earlier within the TED Talk, social connectivity is the difference between high-performing groups and low-performing groups. And as you think about training and education, I want you to think about that social connectivity and how you're working with others to help you elevate your game and sharpen your sword. Iron sharpens iron. 
month of October, we're beginning to wrap up. I want to give a shout out tomorrow, Business Planning Clinic from 8.30 to 2 down at the War Memorial. We have 156 people registered for Business Planning Clinic. You want to know you cannot achieve your goals unless you understand your numbers. The entire option, the entire goal of Business Planning Clinic is to help you break down your numbers so that you understand where it is that you're trying to achieve and how you're going to get there. With that then, I apologize that I missed Bold last week, but I heard Bold was an incredible kickoff and Bold will come back on October 23rd. And I think the resounding thing that I heard was that Amber is a badass woman, just as I uh, basically put her up to be. So I'm excited for the Bold Room uh, this fall. There's 150 agents in the Bold Room over the next the course of the next six weeks that do 400 million in volume and 9 million in GCI. And they made a choice. Last time you hear me talk about Bold, starts back up again on the 23rd. Uh, also today, uh, a KW Cares event, Multiply Your Business from 11 to 2.30. We'll have watch parties in all of the offices. Um, you know, if you don't understand or know the impact of KW Cares, it's actually quite profound. And uh, what they do in moments of natural disasters to make sure that they take care of our own from a KW perspective is amazing. And a lot of times we don't pay attention to it until it hits home. It's true. We haven't felt the impact of it on a macro scale, but I'll tell you many others have. And I'll use a real example. We've had an associate, and I, for confidentiality reasons, I won't share who, we had an associate earlier this year that was awarded $30,000 through KW Cares. Okay? So I'll tell you, it makes an impact. $30,000 to a family that's going through something is a ton of money. Ton. So they're doing a multiply your business event today with some of the top, top, top instructors within the KW world today from 11 to 2.30. Feel free to check it out. We'll be streaming it in all of the offices live for you to be able to jump into that, to be able to multiply your business. Sweet. Business planning clinic I talked about. Join us tomorrow, the 16th from 8.30 to 2 down at the War Memorial. And for those of you that are in the Bold Room, this is my gift to you. It is free for those that are in the bold room. APHW has upcoming trainings to help you understand how to take advantage of warranties within your business. Next one is next week, Monday at 11 via Zoom. And lastly, from a training and education standpoint, I think the number one most highest engaged thing that we do every year that gives me the most amount of anxiety is the holiday party. <laughs> you know, it was funny. I was explaining this yesterday to the team and they said, why does the holiday party give you so much anxiety? I said, eight open bars. <laughs> It's all you need to know. It's at the Fister. It is, this is not a typo. It is on Thursday, December 5th. I'll tell you, finding a location for 700 people in Milwaukee is not easy and you can't be picky on your dates. So I will tell you, it, it, there is also a Packers home game that night. We will have it streaming. They're playing the Detroit Lions. Um, so we have a lot of things lined up to make it a really great event. I please, please, please encourage you to bring your spouse, your partner, uh, whoever it is so that they can get to know the community that you live, work and play within. Yes. Uh, there was a question around good question. Cause I'm all about mitigating risk. <laughs> is there, there is a, there will be a block of rooms at the, at the P Fister hotel to help you. If for those that choose not to want to go home, uh, you can stay at the P Fister at a rate that we will get to you shortly. Last year, I think like 40 people stayed at the St. Kate and it turned out to be a really great evening. So stay tuned. All right, here we go. Ready? Last week, uh, I was grateful. Mandy gave, walked through, um, some market insights that we pulled together um, to help you guys understand where we are, but it was very micro in focus. Okay. It was to help you understand that like the business is moving, the business is happening, the tide is rising, and I'm going to zoom out to zoom in. Okay. So now last week we zoomed in, this week we're going to zoom out. And I'm just going to give you two or three slides to help you understand where we are going because I think it's appropriate to help you get in the right mindset because you should be in business planning clinic tomorrow. And this mindset will help you plan for what to have a freaking incredible 2025. First, I'm gonna remind the group, Charlie Munger said, the fortune isn't made in the buyer's cell, it's made in the weight. In the world that applauds big brains, business is a game of strong stomachs. 
Smart people destroy the likelihood of success because they can't stick with their plan. They jump from thing to thing, never unlocking the compounding that creates outsized returns. And in that way, a person born with few advantages can unlock the greatest one, unrelenting focus. Business is a game of strong stomachs. And if you want to unlock your advantage, it's unrelenting focus because it's hard to suck when you've done something more than anyone else. Time on task, time on task, time on task. So if you remember from last year, I gave you my outlook in December of 2023. And the prognostic I gave you was if the market is flat, I'm happy. And if the market is up single digits, I'm ecstatic. So let's zoom out to zoom in. This is the four county sale price going back to 2020. Okay. And here's what you need to know. Time in the market beats timing the market. Many of you have had clients who have said, am I buying too high? Am I buying too high? Am I buying too high? Okay. Here's a little bit of info. And don't worry, I'll get all this information to you because there's more really good nuggets. Okay. The 24 year appreciate, 25 year appreciation from 2020 through third quarter of 2024 is 146%. Again, we talk about unrelenting focus and helping our clients take advantage of compounding interest. The 10-year appreciation within the four-county metro area is 96%. The five-year appreciation is up 38%. Okay, And you have to remember, the average homeowner moves every five to seven years. Every five to seven years, the market will eventually correct itself. Now, Time in the market beats timing the market. There's circumstances where, let's just go back to 08, that someone had to sell an 11. Unfortunate set of circumstances. However, over time, and you can see the 24-year appreciation, the 10-year appreciation, the five-year appreciation, time on task, time in the market beats timing the market. Okay? That was first on average sale price. Second is on transactional units through the third quarter. Same thing. And this data is going back to 2000. Okay, what goes up must come down and what goes down must come up. So if you focus here in 2022 and 2023, here's what I would tell you. The goal of it was survive in advance. Survive in advance. I mean, from 2021 to 2023, the market was quite frankly in a free fall. I never told you that, but it was. Okay, I can tell you that now that we're a year past it, <laughs> but... The market was in a free fall, okay? And if you're still sitting here today and you got licensed prior to 2021, you survived and advanced. Business is built on a game of strong stomachs, okay? You have a strong stomach. Now, the reason why I share this with you is you can see the blip that 2024 has had. It's up single digits. We should be ecstatic, okay? And where my, my point in this is, I do believe that the, the tide will continue to rise. And I do believe that 2023 was the bottom of the market. And for those of you that are playing the long game, because you're in it to build a great career, not just to have a great year. When you're playing the long game over the next five years, I'm very bullish on our market. Now, I'll give you a sidebar piece of commentary that I've had a lot of conversations with people about recently in my travels. Another thing that we need to be very bullish on in the Midwest, and this is very appropriate based on the time that we are in right now, is we have two things going for us, specifically in South, I'll say three things going for us in Southeastern Wisconsin. Lack of natural disaster, disasters, a bountiful supply of fresh water, and for the most part, a very strong public school system across Southeastern Wisconsin. You, we're not going to get any deeper into that than we need to, but, <laughs> but my point to that is you should also be very bullish on the industry that you're in and the profession that you're in and the inventory that you get to sell. Because I will tell you, your peers in Florida, we should probably ask Amber this, they're feeling very much different pressures. And so the reason why I'm sitting here telling you this is you've survived and we will continue to advance. And your time is coming because you're playing the long game. So there's my zoom out to help you zoom in as you plan for 2025, okay?
Wrapping it up with lore. When we look here, KWMKE year to date through 2024, I just highlighted year to date performance, KWMKE versus the Metro MLS. And we talk about not taking our community for granted. This is a reflection of your guys' results. The green is just the ones I highlighted that basically said you're kicking ass. And the ones that I'm most that you should always be focusing on is what your lead activities are. Your lead activities, your listings taken, listing units, listings taken volume, contracts written units, contracts written volume. Why? Because it's your insurance policy to continue to play the game. Don't worry about what you've done. Worry about where you're going or what you're doing, right? And I say this because you guys are freaking killing it. Now, I pulled brokerage results for the top 10 brokerage brands in southeastern Wisconsin, and this is through October 14th. The top 10, and I, I pulled some little nuggets here for the group. The top 10 brokerage brand is insights for southeastern Wisconsin. The top 10 brands control 60% of the market. And then the tail gets really long. Average days on market across the MLS is 32. The average price point is 373 right now. Okay. This is just through October 14th. Now, the reason why I share this with you is you can play with how you position yourself within these numbers to help you win the listing appointment. As a whole, KW Associates sell homes 25% faster than the market, working in an average price point that is 11% higher. Again, you're a part of an incredibly highly productive group, and we want to be known as a culture of productivity. Focusing on the luxury market, uh, again, this is all relative recent data, 1, 1 through 10, 14 in price point 750,000 plus KWMKE sells 53% more luxury homes than the second largest brand in Southeastern Wisconsin, and they sell them 37% faster. It's a pretty highly productive group. Lastly, because I've had a lot of questions on this, the one, the other thing I will share with the group is this, I've had a lot of people, oh, the changes, you know, this company X is doing an auction, company Y is doing this flat fee, company Z is doing this. And I said, how is that impacting their trends? Here's what I will remind you. None of those companies are in your business plan. None of them, okay? The reason why I don't talk about any of them is they don't have an impact on what it is that you do and how you deliver your value or service. However, data is important to help you understand and be grounded in who you are and what you do. So from a flat fee perspective, you can see here how the flat, the I just chose the three largest flat fees, how they're performing so far year to date within the market. So stay true to who you are and stay true to the value that you bring to your clients and you will be fine. Don't worry about those that are the detractors within your business because they aren't within your business plan. You can only control what you can control with how you deliver your service. So with that GCI, we in September, we paid out 5.2 million. It was up 11% versus September of last year. Year to date, we've paid 44.2 million in commissions, up 5.3%. And in September, we'll pay out 57,000 in profit share that will be coming next week, Tuesday, maybe the 21st. And year to date, we'll have paid out 658,000. And I do want to bring a little clarity to this because it was interesting. I got a few text messages about this. When I shared this last month, I do want to create clarity for people. This was just for the one month of August. This wasn't on an annualized basis. So like Griffin Peterson, shout out to Griffin. He, he got $1,022 just for one month. So I just wanted to create a little clarity to that because the power of profit share is real and you can take advantage of it. All right, September awards. I'm going to set the stage for September awards to kind of break the ice, okay? And here's what I would tell you. Many of you know, I think Nike is one of the most phenomenal consumer brands at telling stories without putting their logo in your face. And I've, again, for those who've been around a while, you know I've used Nike a lot in their last year during Caitlin Clark's run. I used a lot of examples of how they were interrupting the market space during Caitlin's Final Four run. Uh, <clears throat> in a variety of other ways, they're really good at telling their story without putting their logo all over your face, okay? But I think their most recent ad, uh, if you don't know, Sunday was the Chicago Marathon. And then right at, on Monday morning, Nike dropped an ad I thought was ingenious. 
Okay. And it will be very funny when you think about how this correlates to September awards. So stay with me here. Winning isn't comfortable. So I lead with that to say winning isn't comfortable. And I recognize some of you may be walking around here in October feeling like that after the year you've had in the real estate business. So let's September home run club, one listing, one listing taken, one contract written, one contract closed. This is the group you want to be a part of. The fact that there's two columns in the month of September is incredible. And around and the level of productivity of this group is unmatched within the industry in southeastern Wisconsin. It means you got paid and you have the insurance policy that can, that means you will continue to get paid. Highest percentage volume increase year to date. I want to give a shout out to Levine Realty Group, Ross Treffer, Melena Cortez, Nathan Baraki, uh, Anitra Tatum, Teresa Brown, Judy Hebner, Sig Realty, Say, Amber, Devin White, Bethany Clark, Jess Annabelle, Deborah Croft, and congrats on highest percentage volume increase year to date. I'm sure those people are feeling similar to the Nike ad. <laughs> All right, GCI Earn for agents on a team, Steph Miller, Janine Warner, Martha Ola, Ginger Lazovic, Kathy Shaw, Will Stale, Maggie Drain, Ellen Pertel, Megan Stale, Stephanie Minnick, Casey Lopez, Kirsten Lindstrom, Katherine Egohoff, Andy Stillman, Holly Gamblin, and Melena Cortez. Congrats on the agents on the team. All right, percentage volume increase so far. Oh, we did that. Uh, September individual volume. Carla Florence, I got to give a shout out to Carla. Uh, she had a tough month. Her husband passed, her father passed. Um, and I I know Carla, I just wanted you to know how much we love you. And I she asked for a lot of privacy during a lot of what she was going through. But uh to finish number one in September while dealing with that is she's been through a lot. She's been through a lot and she's had unrelenting focus. You can have unrelenting focus in your personal life and you can have unrelenting focus in your professional life. And I'll tell you, you can do both. You can, you can do both. So Carla, congrats on an incredible September. Chris, Mara, Jean, Becky, Catherine, Jordan, Joey Carini, Tori Wagner, sorry, Sarah Oberbunner, Marybeth Milky, Nicole, Abby Wall, Michael Langenhall, John Molitor, Mary Beth Freckman, Melissa Delzer, Connie Cummings, Ethan Mass, and Sarah Reardon. Congrats on top 15 in the month of September. <laughs> September team volume, FRG, JSG, House to Home, Gallagher Lake Country, Root River, On Point, SRG, Duvall, Kindred, PPG, Dust East, Jeff Johns, A. Key Home, Miller Marriott, Levine, Wessel, The Gossmans, The Wilds, Enlighten, and MTM Collective rounding out team volume for the month of September. Individual units year to date. Molitor absolutely crushing it, leading the way as he does. I missed the three-peat suits on a uh, Tuesday. Uh, Lori Stroke, Abby Wall, Joey Carini, Sarah O, Jean, Ethan, Bridget, Elena, Nick Fetting, Demera, Elise Bolt, Jessica, Kristen, Lindsay, Mara, Ross, Sarah Reardon, Kevin Madsen, Carla, Florence, rounding out individual units year to date. Year to date team units, JSG leading the way, Root River, FRG, House to Home, SRG, On Point, Levine, PPG, a Key Home, Duvall Group, Enlighten, Destys, Miller Marriott, Gossman, Fairhit, and Fernwood, Wessel, Kindred, Holt Team, and Team Trimble, rounding out team units year to date. Year to date individual volume, Gene leading the way, Molitor clipping right at her heels, and Ty coming in hot. Becky Thomas, Elena, Abby, Ethan, Carla, Sarah, Kristen, Joey, Mary Beth, Elise, Jessica, Robin, Mara, Lori, Ross, Demera, and Connie rounding out the top 15 year to date individual volume and year to date individual or year to date team. My apologies. JSG, FRG, SRG, House to Home, On Point, Root River, Destys, Team Trimble, PPG, Gallagher, Duvall, A Key Home, 
Double Bolt, Miller Marriott, Levine, Fair Hinton, Kindred, Enlighten, the Gossman Group, and the Wessel Group, rounding out year-to-date team volume. Guys, you're a part of an incredibly productive group. We are a culture of productivity. Lean on each other. Lean to the person on the right of you and lean to the person on the right left of you. Social connectivity is the key to finding fulfillment and purpose. And don't lose sight of that in a very divisive time. Cool. With that, chop wood, carry water, make an impact. And we'll see you tomorrow at Business Planning Clinic. Guys, have a great day.